Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, over the weekend, many of us in the meteorological community were amazed at the large dust storm that was coming off of the west coast of Africa. Now, I know it's not hurricane season, so we're not usually talking too much about Saharan dust here, but I was mostly amazed by just the sheer size of this. You see, it's difficult sometimes to understand the size of weather events happening around the world when it's not in your own backyard to compare your own idea of how big things are are. So I just want to show you something. When you see this particular plume of dust, compared to my home state of Illinois, I think it's at least five times the size of Illinois. So just a quick snapshot here of what the state of Illinois looks like compared to the west coast of Africa. Back in the United States, Friday was a pretty interesting day here because when we look back uh, over the, at least the last decade, and we were having a great discussion about this over the weekend, Friday, February 21st for the lower 48 may have been one of the top 10 driest days, 24 hour time periods on record. Now, of course, we did have a cutoff low that was coming into parts of California, and we were still dealing with the exiting of that low pressure system that put down some snow over here in North Carolina. But overall, that was a pretty interesting day to see such a large lack of organized low pressure systems across the United States. So since I just showed you what was going on in North Carolina, I just want to take you back to Friday. There we can see the snow in the Appalachian Mountains right there on the Blue Ridge Mountains. And you can see coming out into the Piedmont and the coastal plain, if we just kind of draw a line there to the south and east of that, that was all snow. But with the warmth that returned over the weekend, take a look at this. This is now Saturday and by Sunday that was all completely melted away. And that's because much of the eastern half of the country on Sunday saw very, very warm conditions. Okay, what we've seen since then was that the cutoff low that went through California, dumping quite a bit of heavy rainfall, uh, not only there, but in parts of Nevada and Arizona has now emerged into the central United States. And it's teaming up with a low that has come out of the Pacific Northwest that's moving through parts of the North Central Plains, getting into the High Plains uh, today. Well, we want to talk about is how much rain we're expecting to get out of this and also how difficult of a snowfall forecast this is going to be. What's making it challenging is that there's two separate waves at work here. Our lead wave, which was once the cutoff low, is now sitting here. And the wave that's following it on the back side is sitting there. And these two waves are resisting phasing together and working together, which is making not only the temperature, but the precipitation type forecast quite challenging. Let me show you what I mean. At the surface, we can see two separate circulations. There's one here and there's one there. Very windy conditions coming off of the Rocky Mountains through the Front Range and through the High Plains today. And also with that, some snow in parts of Wyoming, uh, Montana, North and South Dakota, and parts of Nebraska. But the lead system is quite warm, so the moisture advection out ahead of that one is going to produce almost entirely a rain event until the second wave comes in on the back side. And that's what we've got to try to understand, diagnose, and then eventually forecast. So the National Weather Service right now, let's start west, has winter weather advisories and some wind warnings out uh, for the high plains. Again, you saw those strong winds. Maybe two to five inches of snowfall in some of the regions that you see here that have winter weather advisories. To the south of it, what, uh, flood watch is in through here and a few regions of flood warnings. And this is our winter storm watch area right in through here in Iowa, northern Illinois, and southern Wisconsin. Now, these winter weather problems are going to extend to the east into Michigan with time. And you can see that maybe a little bit better here by looking at the winter storm severity index for this next system. Now, you can match up the colors over there on the right, but I want to talk with you about the challenges in forecasting this system. One of the biggest problems with these two short waves not phasing together is that we don't have a well-defined axis of deformation. You see, a lot of times with systems like this, we end up getting mid-level wind fields that do something like this. So two pieces, one from the north, one from the south, split right along an axis deformation. And wherever that occurs, we can often identify that area as having the heaviest snowfall amounts. This system isn't going to have it. We have a stacked set of waves here, and as a result, they're not producing a well-defined axis of deformation. My other problem is with temperatures, and therefore using liquid to snow ratios that are too high may bias our snowfall amounts incorrectly, possibly too high in this area. So let's get in a snowfall forecast for that region because I know we have a lot of viewers in Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Michigan. So here we go. This is from uh, uh, the uh, NOAA and the National Weather Service here. We're looking at the 72-hour probability of getting at least four inches of snow. So we can see the event happening in the high plains, and then the main axis, at least identified here by NOAA, is right in through here for snow. 
But many meteorologists in NOAA are going to wake up this morning and as they do go back and to, re to forecast the next stage of this are going to be struggling because of the differences in our models. And there's some important ones. So let's start off here with the National Digital Forecast Database. Again, there's that two to five inch snowfall event we talked about in parts of the High Plains. Focusing now on Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Michigan, you can see that the National Digital Forecast Database has a large region in here of six to 10 inches of snow. But I'm going to make an argument that producing a good forecast of snowfall amount and even the location of the snow is going to be quite challenging. Here's part of that argument. Early this morning when we got the latest European model, we saw a significant trend over the last 36 hours of the European model taking this main snowfall axis and shifting it farther to the south and to the east. That could basically give a huge snowfall bust if you're talking about places maybe from Iowa City over toward Madison, Milwaukee, and then into central Michigan. If that slides farther to the south, well, it's going to be getting into some warmer air, which is also going to make this challenging to pick up snowfall amounts. Now, what was interesting was it wasn't just the operational run from the European that gave us this. This is the European ensemble from the Zero Z run from today. And it also has the main axis sitting right here. Again, this comes back to the challenge of getting these two waves to phase together to help us understand where the snowfall is going to be. And I'm going to show you the temperature problem in just a few moments. We do have other models to look at, though. Even the GFS has started to trend south and east, but it still has a heavy uh, a corridor, a corridor in there, a very heavy snowfall, again, easily greater than six inches. If we look over at the NAM, our high resolution model, it extends the heaviest snow farther south and east and brings it all the way back into this part of Missouri as well. But you notice that each of these last three model runs I've showed you do not have the heavier snowfall amounts to the north like the National Weather Service currently does. So we need to watch all morning long to see if the National Weather Service makes adjustments to this. I feel for those guys. This is a very, very challenging forecast for all of us. We do have another model to look at. It's Germany's ICON model. It highlights kind of a blend, I feel, of all of the models I've showed you so far. But it says right in here the potential for picking up quite a bit of snow. I would make an argument that a 10 to 1 ratio with this next system is not the right ratio to use given how much warm air is out ahead of this and that the temperatures coming in behind it are not that cold. Before I show you that, those temperatures, I do at least want to show you over the next week what we're looking at in terms of total accumulated precipitation. So again, here's the snow coming down out of the high plains with this system. They then merge and come right in through here. To the south and east of there, where we've had so much rainfall as of late, we're adding another half inch to an inch and a half of total accumulated precip. Now, it will be coming primarily in bands right in through this area, so you can see that pretty well resolved here in the European model. So we still have our flooding problem, even on just a little bit of rainfall here, our flooding problem in parts of the mid-south and the southeast. Now, let's watch the systems coming in on the European. First system is here, second one is here, okay? Now, as we play this one forward, let's pause it right there and step you back. You will see that the lead wave opens up and moves through Southern Illinois by tonight, and it's an all rain event. I'm rock back and forth here on Monday into early Tuesday morning. The second wave is pushing through the high plains, putting down that snow. Now, by Tuesday morning, into Tuesday afternoon and evening, the operational European model wants to cool things off enough in here to give some snow as the light snow still pulls down here into parts of the central plains, so Colorado, Nebraska, Kansas. Now, as this happens, look at how strong the winds are in here between the opening low pressure center there and the high cell pressure cell behind it. Now, as this comes through, we see that right in through here, is where we're expecting the corridor of potentially heaviest snow. There will certainly be northerly winds dropping temperatures early Wednesday morning, but I think the reason why we're getting the heaviest snow through there is because this is happening overnight on Tuesday into Wednesday morning when the temperature will be the coolest. We still have plenty of upper level moisture in place to produce quite a bit of snow in this area. I still don't want to give you a number on the amount because I don't think I know well enough to tell you. But watch that corridor. Keeping moving, this is now Wednesday afternoon and evening. And as this system moves on up toward the north and east where these waves finally work together, it's going to be producing extremely windy conditions with a lot of cold air on the backside by Thursday morning. But again, right here will be the main dividing line between where the snow will be falling in the interior and the rain will be along the coast, which is what the Northeast has just seen so often this year. Well, as this moves through, let me show you after Thursday. Getting into Thursday, Friday, 
and this Saturday. What do we not see? We don't see any more large, organized, low-pressure systems sweeping through the midsection of the country. In fact, we may not see the next one until we get out to Monday into Tuesday. That was that drier time period I mentioned in last Thursday's video. But you do see that by the time we get into next, possibly Monday night into Tuesday morning, the operational European model wants to do what we've seen it do so many times. Drop a high pressure cell off the East Coast, pump the moisture in out of the Gulf, have a lifting storm track with lots of rain pretty far to the north, but potentially some very heavy snow on the back side of this. So the question is, now this is getting out there pretty far, you know, is that system really showing up? And to look at that, we got to go over to our ensemble model and look at the upper levels of the atmosphere. Our main discussion for the last couple of weeks has been about the position and strength of that ridge compared to where the coldest air has been sitting in uh, over the Arctic and here over the North Atlantic. So this ridge in the Gulf of Alaska, watch it carefully with me, okay? Because next Monday, it sits right in through here and we can see that our main trough sweeping across the Canadian prairies into the lower 48 extends right back into the four corner states. Now that is a setup for producing large low pressure systems in the midsection of the country for next week. And also the trough off the east coast is what's going to keep parts of the southeast on the cooler side of things for about five to six days. Now this is out to Monday, March 2nd. Look at this. By the time we get to the 5th, did you notice the main difference there? This ridge now moves back over the Aleutian Islands, and that is critical to our upcoming forecast. The main trough is still sitting over the Arctic and over the North Atlantic. That's our two kind of pockets of coolest air. But this trough will sweep through into the midsection of the country and give us, again, a wet end to next week as well. So very active next week is what we're looking at here. But watch this, California. We've been discussing for the last two weeks that the models have been hinting at taking that ridge and shoving it farther to the west. Therefore, when we look out from March 2nd to March 9th, I'm seeing a couple of important changes. Because that ridge is backing its way in this direction, we are starting to see California's precipitation anomalies reduce with time. In other words, they're not getting quite as dry. And I'm starting to see some moisture, some wetter than average conditions showing up here. Now, certainly with that happening and the trough coming into the west like this, wow, we're going to be really helping this region out pick up quite a bit more precipitation, which is also impressive when I say that over the last four runs of the European weeklies when looking at March, they've picked up on this pattern. And that's given me some confidence to use those European weekly forecasts out farther and farther when I see them doing so well here. But that looks as though when we look exclusively at week two, so that's March 2nd to March 9th, that we're going to have this trough that digs in, active weather here in the eastern half of the United States. But watch the shift happening out west. Because by the time we look at that time period, look, our ridge is now here. And the main trough shapes like this. And that is enough to start to change the trajectory of the motion off the Pacific to be bringing in moisture to California. Now, that would be a critical just to get them to return to normal moisture by the time we get to this point in March. But what does this also do? It relaxes the temperature pattern across the rest of the lower 48 as the coldest air stays tucked way up here in the Arctic. So let's talk about those temperatures. Now, this week, this is the week where we have the cool down coming. So this is Monday's high temperatures. As I click play here, let's stop it on Tuesday. Now you're going to notice one thing. Throughout this entire animation, California stays on the warmer side of things. But on Tuesday, look at this. You see why I'm having a, a lot of trouble figuring out that snowfall amount? As this system starts in Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Michigan, we have a lot of 33 to 36 degree temperatures here. It won't be until we get into Wednesday that there's enough colder air up there to support some snow. But that'll already be after the main push of moisture. So we're just going to have to watch the back side of this. Pretty cold air coming into the northern plains here. California stays quite warm this week. In fact, up into the 80s by the time we get into Thursday. As the coolest air sneaks through the Great Plains, excuse me, yeah, through the Great Plains, but into the Great Lakes region. And then on off to the north and east by Friday. But by the end of the week, Saturday getting into Sunday, that cold air moves out. And look at the warmth already pushing back up on Sunday through the central plains of the United States. So we put all the next five days together, we get this. Warm in California, warm through the Canadian prairies. The coolest air starts here. And then over the coming days, like day five through ten, moves over to the south and east. 
But with the ridge that was in the Gulf of Alaska moving back west, the coldest air stays over Alaska and Greenland. And you see that all the way out here uh, to, to March 10th, that particular pattern is going to keep the coldest air in, in the northern hemisphere over Alaska and Greenland. And that's going to relax the pattern across the eastern half of the country, bringing it back over toward warm. But still, remember, the trough is there. And that's going to make this area active in terms of precipitation. But also... With that cutoff low, possibly helping California as well. That's our main setup, getting all the way out to March 10th here. Okay, what's going on beyond that? Well, we've seen an incredibly strong polar vortex this winter. It's kept the Arctic Oscillation well above average for most of winter. And currently, the zonal winds where the uh, stratospheric polar vortex sits are almost at record levels. So therefore, we are almost out of time for any sort of a disruption in the polar vortex to bring in sustained very cold air anywhere into the lower 48. So with that, let me at least show you what it's doing in Europe as well. With the strong polar vortex, uh, over the next 10 to 15 days, look at the map on the right, it's going to be very difficult to bring much below average temperatures here into parts of Ukraine, the Black Sea region. Uh, so that includes the Russian wheat belt and Kazakhstan. So that area is staying very warm as well. But quite active in terms of precip here as we take a quick snapshot uh, at Europe and its precip patterns over the next uh, week to 10 days. Outside of that, let's go to the tropics now. The Mount Julian Oscillation has come out of phase five and six, and it would look like it was going to go toward phase eight one, which would give us more sustained cool weather. But it got right about here, and now the latest forecast plumes take it back over into these warmer phases for much of North America, phase three, four, and five. So that means the tropics are weakly interacting with uh, the extra tropics or the mid latitudes, but certainly supportive of a lack of sustained cold air in the eastern half of North America. So one last thing to show you here before we give you a South America forecast is what's going on in the upper levels of the atmosphere. I only want to focus on South America at this point because we notice associated with the Mad Julian Oscillation, these warmer colors represent sinking motion in the atmosphere. And I see kind of lining up here with Western Brazil getting into Argentina, upper level suppression uh, of vertical motion. And that is manifesting itself over the next 10 days as producing a drier corridor in through here while much wetter than average conditions sneak into this part of Brazil. Now, as we think about this, we are trying to actively harvest a crop right in through here to get safrina corn and cotton in. And it's looking again like they're going to be wetter than average over the next 10 days, which could slow that progress. Remember, once we get into the beginning of March, we start to push into that time period where if we don't get the safrina crop planted, we could possibly run out of monsoonal moisture at the end of the safrina crop when it's trying to mature, which is when it desperately needs that rainfall. Here's another thing to think about. Look down here here in Argentina. We've known that the long-range European weeklies have been forecasting a dry March for Argentina. And this now takes you all the way up to March the 5th, and it is clearly showing that drier pattern. But as I started off this video, just to make sure that we understand the sheer size of some of the growing regions in South America, you've probably been looking over there at that map on the left. I put Illinois inside of Mato Grosso, and it fits easily inside of that state in Brazil. And look at where I put Iowa down here, kind of in that triangle between Cordoba, Santa Fe, and Buenos Aires. And again, you can see the sheer size of the growing areas that are in South America. South America is certainly something we're going to be talking about in our long-range analysis coming out on Wednesday. And we're also going to be giving a new kind of idea about what's coming up for spring uh, in that long-range analysis too. So tune back in each day this week at my.nutrientactsolutions.com to get the latest. And we'll talk to you again very soon. Thank you.